brand creation and then brand elevation and continuously doubling down on that makes a huge difference because I have very geeky investors. They constantly send me content. So I think that I have the geekiest investors in America, right? Silicon Valley people, computer science graduates, they work for companies like Google and HP. And that's my niche because there are roughly 6 million accredited investors in the United States. I need a thousand of them to raise 325 million. I don't have any uh, institutional capital. I have no family offices. I have no, nothing but these accredited investors. A thousand gave me $325 million. That's all I needed. A thousand out of 6 million. So you can build an extraordinary niche. That's one out of a, you know, a hundred thousand people that really believes in what you believe in. And those are the best investors. That's how I build my brand. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Conner. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host, also known as the Private Money Authority. And this is the show where we talk about raising private money without ever having to ask for money. Here on the show, I have amazing guests join me. And today is no exception. I've got an amazing guest. He's CEO and founder of not one, but two commercial real estate investment companies. And his companies use something very different, cutting edge real estate an analytics technology to source and acquire or build large commercial properties all across the U.S. Now, the way he goes about funding this is from over 1,000 private lenders or investors. His current portfolio has got over 4,400 units and he has raised $325 million in private money. Now, what he does, he shares his team's unique and cutting edge real estate data methodologies to connect with data-driven investors. So if you're a geek, you're definitely going to want to tune into this show. Uh, who share his vision? And what's his vision? Well, that data beats gut feel by a million miles. So over 10,000 real estate investors have taken his free real estate data analytics course on Udemy. And his course on Udemy, again, that's titled Real Estate Data Analytics. His course has got over 1,000 five-star reviews. In addition to that, over 5,000 investors have attended his multifamily webinar series each year, and hundreds of people have attended what he calls his Magic of Multifamily Boot Camps. Well, my guest believes that we are now at a turning point where traditional commercial real estate will combine with prop tech and fintech technology disruptors and will truly reach its potential as a tradable, highly liquid assets class that will rival and eventually beat the stock market in its size and scope. In just a moment, you're going to meet my special guest, Mr. Neil Bawa, right after this. Neil, welcome to the show, my friend. Well, thanks for having me on the show, Jay. Very excited to be here. Absolutely. I'm excited to have you here because my lands, you've raised $325 million in private money from uh, individual investors. We definitely want to dive deep into how you've gone about that, your favorite ways to raise private money, lessons learned about what to do and what not to do when it comes to raising private money. We've got two primary audiences here for this show, Neil. We've got real estate investors that are wanting to learn how to raise private money for their real estate deals. And then we have another part of our audience that just want to be passive investors. They want to be private lenders. They want to invest and we'll be able to talk about your syndication opportunity as well. But if you will take a moment, Neil, give us your backstory as to how you got to where you are now. Sure. I'm a technologist, computer science degree. Uh, data science is my uh, major. And um, I got into real estate in reverse. You know, most people get into real estate by buying a single family rental or you know, doing a rehab. Uh, in my case, I got into uh, real estate by 
uh, building a campus from scratch in 2003. So my, uh, I was uh, running a technology company, hundreds of employees. We had lots of money and we decided we didn't want to be tenants anymore. So we built a custom campus for ourselves. You know, the founder uh, and the senior partner of the firm, I was a junior partner, uh, had a lot of construction experience. So he mentored me through the whole process and it was a great learning experience. And we ended up building about six more campuses um, by 2007. So between 2003 and 2007, we were building all of these campuses. And uh, I was a minor partner in, in some of them. And all of a sudden, I got exposed to the benefits of depreciation because I had the big fact tech salary and I was in an, you know, I was working in Taxifornia. So for people like me with the big fat tech salary that are Taxifornians, it's uh, very important to all of a sudden get these, these depreciation benefits and, and how it affects your, your income is just spectacular. And so that's what really pulled me into real estate. But, you know, with, with all of the benefits that I re was receiving from depreciation, all of a sudden I had more and more money collecting in the bank. So uh, by the time I had plenty of money, it was 2008. So my timing was incredible. <laughs> I hear you. Yes, um, I got my wake up call to the world of private money in uh, January of 2009 is when I got my wake up call. I'd been relying on banks and just institutional lending um, until I got cut off from the banks in January 2009. And so that's how I got exposed to this world of private money where well, you've raised a lot of private money here in your career. That's right. And so what are some of your favorite ways that you've gone about raising private money? And, in, and finding investors. I think the, the biggest thing that has worked for me is building an authentic brand with the word authentic being the one that's underlined, not the word brand. A lot of people build brands, but I find that, that they're not necessarily authentic. So, you know, as, as somebody who's a computer science graduate, as somebody that's into data science, I felt that that was my strong suit. And I felt that given that I live in Silicon Valley with, you know, if, you, if I throw a rock, it's going to hit a geek and bounce off and hit another geek right? This, this is just geek land. There's lots and lots of, you know, computer science graduates here and data scientists and, and you know, lots of people that understand technology and numbers and exponential, you know, uh, worth. So I, I felt like I was in the right place. And so what I've done is I've worked very hard over the last, uh, you know, 10-ish years to build an authentic data brand. And I've followed through on all of the different pieces of that. And I'll give you examples of how anyone else could do it, right? But I'm going to start with an example that's today's example. So this morning, um, you know, when I w wake up in the morning, I'll spend an hour, hour and a half reading all of the newsletters that I'm subscribed to for real estate. And there's dozens of them. And I'll pick one that has some interesting piece of information. So this morning I received a newsletter from a company called Local Market Monitor. And this is a company that basically ranks cities in the United States um, for real estate investment. And it's, you know, I'm a multifamily guy and this is a sort of a single family thing. But from a, the perspective of brand building, it's perfect. So a screenshot of local market monitor was taken out of their article, right? And the article, the, the, the screenshot says best bets for 2005. And this got a, uh, you know, a list of cities uh, starting with Charleston, South Carolina. And then the next column says three year population growth and then job growth, right? So now what I do is I take that content and then I have a Slack channel and the Slack channel is called marketing dash social dash posting, right? So I have full-time staff doing this. So I go, I throw that screenshot in there and then I say the following words. A lot of people share information on their social, but what they really forget is that they're building a data-driven brand. So sharing something on social is not very powerful. Sharing it with your opinion is powerful. So I'm going to read off what I shared right on this. And I, I say in the Slack channel, Neil's comments, and my team will post this on all social. Local Market Monitor has published their best bets market for 2025. Very interesting list. Terrific to see Charleston, South Carolina at the top of the list. Fantastic market, a lot of room to run. But I'm even more excited to see Indianapolis in second position because a Republican victory in last week's elections means tariffs being imposed on China, which means more manufacturing growth. And Indianapolis is one of the key markets that will see significant um, industrial growth. I won't read the whole thing, but you get the point, right? What I'm doing is I'm taking content that's come from sources that I like, and then I'm putting my personal spin on it uh, as to why all of a sudden people should be investing in Indianapolis, right? Or things like that. And then I, I do this at least twice a day, three times a day. And I'm posting on you know, LinkedIn. My, my team is doing all of this stuff using software like Hootsuite. Um, and so they're designing custom graphics. So the custom graphic that was designed was designed so that my picture was on the left. Uh, the, my quote, a quote about Indianapolis was at the bottom. And then the original source, that screenshot was on the right. 
So now this is a custom graphic that was designed in about 10 minutes using AI and was posted on this channel. I took a look at it. I commented. I don't actually go on to social. People think that I'm on social media all the time. They're like, Neil doesn't actually do any work. He must just spend 24 hours a day on social media. Well, the last time I actually logged into social media was 2014, 10 years ago. But what I do is I, I, I have a team of people. Today I have a team. When I started out, it was just somebody on Upwork.com from the Philippines that I was paying two hours a day. Anyone can pay that $6 an hour for two hours a day. Everyone can afford it. You make that investment in yourself. And now, of course, there's a you know huge team of you know people. About 10 people are, are doing investor marketing for us. Um, but, but that gives you a sense of this, right? So I've been authentic to that data brand. I've created webinars. I'm doing a webinar tonight at, at 5 p.m. Pacific. I have uh, 1,950 people signed up. About 400 will attend, about a 20% show rate. And that webinar is about the impact of the Trump win on commercial real estate and has nine sections. So I talk about the impact on the dollar, the yuan. I talk about the impact on Bitcoin. I talk about the impact on tariffs, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, is this good for commercial real estate? Bad? What about interest rates? What about treasury? Um, so you notice that I've given you two examples, both from today, of how I am building an authentic data brand. I'm not suggesting that this is the right thing for everybody. But what I'm saying is that you've got to be authentic and you've got to be continuously providing content. I hate social media. I don't like going into any of those apps. So I just created a Slack channel and I have people helping me, right? And at $6 an hour for wonderful people in the Philippines, nobody can say, I don't have the money for people to help me. Everybody has that much of an investment to make, right? So brand creation and then brand elevation and continuously doubling down on that makes a huge difference because I have very geeky investors. They constantly send me content. So I think that I have the geekiest investors in America, right? Silicon Valley people, computer science graduates, they work for companies like Google and HP. And that's my niche because there are roughly 6 million accredited investors in the United States. I need a thousand of them to raise 325 million. I don't have any uh, institutional capital. I have no family offices. I have no, nothing but these accredited investors. A thousand gave me $325 million. That's all I needed. A thousand out of 6 million. So you can build an extraordinary niche. That's one out of a, you know, a hundred thousand people that really believes in what you believe in. And those are the best investors. That's how I build my brand. So let me unpack uh, what you just said there. So what you're doing, you and your team is you are providing on social media, amazing content about opportunities and what's going on in the real estate investment world. And a result of that content is you're giving great value. And I suppose to that content, your subscribers and your number of people that are following you, and subscribing to your channel because of the great value continues to grow on a regular basis. Is that right? That's right. We just hit our 10,000th subscriber on, on YouTube. Uh, Instagram is a huge channel for us. Um, and uh, so is Udemy. So on Udemy, I create courses around real estate analytics. So, right. So these courses are courses that Basically, I'm taking real estate analytics, which is complicated and dumbing it down by giving people a bunch of Excel spreadsheet. Go in here for this city, plug in these date, pieces of data, which are general knowledge, and then look at the result. And if it's green, it's good. If it's red, it's bad. As simple as that, right? So what I'm doing is I'm taking a complex topic that most people have trouble with and I'm simplifying it, right? So the course is, is, is called Location Magic, how to figure out the best cities in America to invest in. And they don't have to really learn data analytics. They just have to follow a process that takes about 10 minutes to do. So, you know, you could go to a water cooler conversation for a you know Christmas party and you could hear one person says, Rogers, Arkansas is a great city to invest in. Another person says, no, 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 no. Rogers, Arkansas sucks. It's Charleston, South Carolina. Well, how do you know which one of these people is telling the truth, right? Well, the answer is there's got to be some benchmark. So I create courses around that. And those courses allow people to make in investment decisions based on their water cooler conversations and their list of cities. And so each year I get hundreds of people thanking me on somebody going and investing in Provo, Utah in 2016. By the way, Provo home prices are up 3x since then. Um, and so they love it, right? And these people, they haven't invested with me. The, the community is about 80,000 people. The total number of investments, investors is 1,000, 1,072 as of yesterday, but that's okay. That's 1%, right? So the 1% the I'm monetizing, the others are simply getting value and they're going out and investing by themselves, doing whatever they want. And I'm perfectly happy with that because it all they're also sending other people to me constantly to build my brand. So they help in some way or the other. 
what I hear you saying, Neil, is that you're really leading with a servant's heart. You're leading with providing amazing value and content. And so you and I have got that in common. Uh, when I was cut off from the banks back in 2009, and I couldn't use institutional money anymore, and I started learning about private money, I made a decision, when it sounds like you made the same decision, that I wasn't gonna go about asking people for money or chasing or begging or persuading or trying to talk anybody into anything, because after all, desperation has got a smell to it. And the worst time, from my experience, to be raising private money and investor money is when you need it for a particular yep. deal. But right. what I did, uh, Neil, is, I put on my teacher hat. So here's my teacher hat and my teacher hat says private money teacher. Love it. <laughs> when I started raising private money, I simply just, I, I, I took on the attitude and the philosophy of I'm not going to try to pitch any deals. I'm first going to teach my opportunity. And you know, I've got, yep. uh, you've got 1,072. All I have is 47, eight and a half million. That's all I need for my single family houses around here in my local area. And so the philosophy is the same. I started teaching people the opportunity. You know what's interesting from my 47 private lenders, none of them ever heard of private money or private lending. I don't think any of them even know what an accredited investor is to tell you the truth. And none of them ever heard of self-directed IRAs. I love working with people that have never been introduced to this world of private money, because when you do that, we get to make the rules. Right. Uh, one thing I had a hard time getting my mind wrapped around when I started out was, you know, traditional borrowing is you go to the local bank or an institutional lender or a hard money lender. And, you know, you get on your hands and knees and beg and put your hands underneath your chin and, and, you know, try to talk them into, you know, loaning your money. Where in this world, I'm not asking for a mortgage. I'm offering a mortgage. I'm offering an opportunity. Would you say that you're subscribing to all that same philosophy? Very much so. Um, I think that I find that there, when you're chasing money, when you're chasing investors and asking them and pushing them for money, you'll get some. But I think that, that that's not the kind of relationship you want to build. Maybe people will give you money once under pressure, but a business is based on recurring revenue. And in, in this case, recurring investments. So you've got to have people giving you money for the second time, the third time, the fourth time. And to do that, it's better to take a slightly slower approach. Uh, in the, in a, over a five-year time, you'd, you'd make you know, 3x as much money and do 3x as many projects. But maybe the first year, you, it'll be a little bit slower than that because you're basically building a brand-based scenario, right? All of the things that you just mentioned, Jay. I mean, those are all the things that have to be done and have to be done correctly. And it, and it takes less time and less effort and less money now because of technology than ever used to. I use artificial intelligence to do tons and tons of things. So I have a 40 slide deck that I'm working on and AI wrote all of the notes. Now I always edit them because it doesn't necessarily do a very good job, but it makes it much easier to edit something than to write it from scratch. Um, when I create webinars, I go into uh, chat GPT four or per perplexity. These are my two, two tools. And I spend about five to 10 minutes talking to it. Just, I, I turn on voice typing and I talk to it. I make mistakes. I said, oops, I made a, you know, I, I said this wrong, but I talk for five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 minutes straight, which is hard to do. That's a massive amount of content. And then I say, okay, chat GPT, structure this. And it structures it for me. And then I structure it for various different purposes. I say, structure this for my PowerPoint designer. These are the kind of slides that I would like. These are the sections. These are the types. It structures it. I copy paste that into a Slack channel. My PowerPoint designer is now working on my deck. Now, then I say structure this for my marketing team and give them three email templates. And it writes email templates based on the content that I've created. And I send those three templates off to them. Then I say, give instructions to my graphics designer to create custom graphics. And it does that. And I copy paste it into a Slack channel for the graphics designer. These are all things that didn't even exist two years ago. So if you should be able to accelerate your brand and create massive amounts of high quality content in a tenth of the time that you could do before November 30th, 2022. That was the date that when ChatGPT came out. So as an entrepreneur, as a, somebody who wants to raise private capital, it's actually much easier to do than it has ever been. I love it. Well, you have certainly tapped into a brilliant strategy, Neil, and that is leveraging the technology 
and uh, and your your delegation reminds me of my father. My father's Wallace Connor. He's 91 years old next month, and he's in the middle of a 350 new home build project. I want to be like him when Jeez. I grow up. But um, yeah, he was known as the dictate, and that's what you did. He's known as the dictate, delegate, disappear man. <laughs> so that's what you're doing. You're dictating, delegating, and getting out of the way and letting other well, people do. I, I like to, I measure the total amount of productivity that I have, but I don't measure the total number of hours. So I, I only work about 27, 28 hours a week. I take, you know, f, you know, six weeks of vacations in a year. Um, and I like that. So, you know, I'll, I'll do my reading between seven and eight and I'm working from eight to two and then I'm done. But what happens is I, I tell people I work about 200 hours a week and they're like, no one can work 200 hours a week. The answer is you can, if you have four full-time executive assistants and they're all very busy and they're all doing very useful things. So I, if you, I spend on an ongoing basis, 30 minutes a day, asking my staff for data, for visual reports on capital raising. I have about a hundred reports on capital raising, right? There's social media channels. There's uh, incoming lead flow. There's uh, what are we doing with uh, email drip campaigns? How many people are coming into drip campaigns? Where are they on the drips? So we have about 13 emails that are dripped on people uh, after they, they join us on, on, on some basis. Then of course there's um, reports on whatever capital raises we're doing right now, right? So, so altogether, I have about 12 different reporting Slack channels and those Slack channels have a, maybe a total of 200 reports. This allows me to be extremely productive and it allows people or it requires my people to be extremely accountable without working a large number of hours. Your systems, your processes define who you are, right? My moniker in the industry is the mad scientist of multifamily because when I present up on stage, I'm always showing people at least a dozen systems and people are taking screenshots of those and, and copying them. And I'm pretty happy about that, right? So. Flattery is a, you know, is is the best form of, uh, you know, best compliment that anyone can ever get. I love it. So let's move over and talk about your opportunities that you have uh, for people that may want to invest. What kind of projects do you have going on now, and what opportunities do you have? Sure. So I run two different companies. One basically buys properties, value-add properties uh, for multifamily. Uh, we, we dabble with other areas like self-storage and industrial, but our core is multifamily. And then the other area is we build townhomes. We don't build single family. We don't build apartments. We build townhomes. Why? Because townhomes, in my opinion, are the missing middle. There's lots of great people building apartment complexes and there's lots of folks like you and Lennar and, and you know, KB homes that are building homes. But the problem is the homes are too expensive. Even starter homes are too expensive. Only about 27% of Americans can afford the starter home that KB homes is building today or Lennar is building today. Uh, and apartments are av available, but have you seen the rent growth? I mean, the rents keep going up from time, to, you know, all this time. And there's a lot of people that don't want to go live in apartments. They don't want to deal with hallways. They don't want to deal with people running up and down the hallways, the smell of marijuana, you know, a, a Rottweiler biting your kid. They want to live in a home, but they know that they've lost the race to buy a home, right? So, so average home prices in the U.S. are $416,000. In most cities that I like for investing in jobs, there are over $500,000. The Phoenix is at 532, Austin's at 536. So most people can't even get the down payment done. And these days the down payment is 20%, it used to be 3%. We don't get loans like that easily available these days. So people have lost that race, but they don't wanna live in apartments. So one of my businesses just builds large townhome for rental communities. So now nobody's living above and below you. You've got a backyard, you've got a garage, maybe not two garages, but one garage. And then you've got, you know, the other car is parked in the driveway or outside. And so you're living in your own home, but you're renting it. And so that project is called Mission 10K. We currently have six uh, projects underway with a thousand units in construction. Uh, we've got $50 million already invested in these projects. Uh, it's, it's more high profit, but higher risk. So what I did was I spent three years and $20 million optimizing the risk. So I basically optimize the risk. So on the front end basis, I don't ask my investors to invest until I've already gotten to the point where the construction loan is signed. I don't know of any other developer that does that because usually it takes you know a half million to a million dollars to get to that point. So I created a company that puts that money up front 
And whenever there's projects that go bad during that time, the company eats it. So no investor ever has to worry about that. But once the risk is done and the project construction loans closed, then I bring the investors in. And now I'm able to accelerate their profits with that company. But there's lots of people who are like, no, 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 I don't want to invest in new construction. They invest in my second company, Grow Capitus. And what Grow Capitus does is that it, it buys properties and improves them. And a lot of people do that. So the people are like, well, what is so special about you doing it? There's like 20 or 200 other guys doing it. My answer is an army in the Philippines. So I own a company in the Philippines with an army of dozens of people. And these people basically for $6 an hour follow six, 700 different systems and processes to optimize my properties. They optimize everything from delinquency to leasing to uh, keep, you know, making sure that my staff in the U.S. is is answering phone calls, you know, to doing hundreds and hundreds of different reports, to getting local grants for tenants, you know, in case my tenants fall behind. I gave you five examples, but there's hundreds of them, and that allows me to keep my properties more full at higher rents than other people. It's the use of systems and processes, hundreds of them, for value-add properties. A typical value-add property is 200 units. And my goal is to keep them at 97, 98% occupied all the time. And every time I get to 98, I raise rents. I fall back to 92. My leasing team comes in, generates massive amounts of leads. We boost it up to 98, and then we raise rents again. And we play this game for five years on a property. I was going to ask about how long on average do you stay in on a property? So it sounds like about five years before you sell or cash out. Is that right? Yep. Five years for value add properties, four years for new construction properties. So, okay. but it, it, we, we don't have to do a lot of short term uh, projects. That's not our forte. I think there's a lot of people doing short term lending and good luck to them. They're, they're doing well. Um, I, I like to build things. I like to improve things. I like to see the, the benefits of all the different things that my team and I are implementing. And so for me, there is a satisfaction th that comes with spending years on a project makes a lot of sense. Well, Neil, you are an amazing human being with all the processes you put in place, leveraging technology, leveraging AI, um, and leveraging human talent all across the globe. I know we've got a lot of listeners here to the show that want to learn how to follow you, how to get in touch with you, how to get on your webinars, how to learn about um, where to invest in the United States, uh, and we've got a lot of people that would be interested in being a passive investor with you as well. So what are some of the ways that people can follow you on social and learn about investment opportunities? Well, I'm very lucky to be the only Neil Bawa with this spelling in the World Wide Web. So everything you need about me, read about me on the web, good or bad, is about me. There's no other Neil Bawa that I'm aware of. So the best way to find me is to just type my first name, last name into Google. Another way, if you'd like to really get involved with our webinars, like the Trump webinar that we're doing tonight, is to go to multifamily university. So type the words multifamily university into Google, and you'll, it'll take you to a site called multifamilyu.com, and you'll see our archived webinars. And you notice that even though the website is called multifamily university, the webinars are about all kinds of things. Our latest webinar is about Airbnb. Our next webinar is about how industrial uh, will need to be rebuilt in the United States because of everything that we're doing with bringing manufacturing jobs back to the United States. So we, you know, so multifamily university is probably the best place. Now, if you're a data geek and you'd like to see how I use data, go to Udemy, that's U-D-E-M-Y.com and search for my name and you'll see my course. Right now I have 14,000 geeky people taking my analytics course. So for those of you that are listening, uh, to follow Neil, to simply Google his name, Neil, N-E-A-L, Bawa, B-A-W-A. -A. Uh, you can also find his course on Udemy, U-D-E-M-Y. I have courses on there as well. And also the webinars that he's doing, um, go to www.multifamilyuniversity.com and you'll get amazing free content and education there. Neil, thank you so much for uh, coming on here with me and any farewell or parting words before we call this show a wrap. I'd like to just share my, the one true saying that I've created myself. And that is that the Bible got it wrong by one letter. The Bible got it wrong by one letter because it is not the meek that shall inherit the earth. It's the geek. It's the geek. 
<laughs> richest man in the world, geek. Second richest, geek. Third richest, geek. You see a pattern there, Jay? Yeah, there is a pattern. There is a pattern. <laughs> Thank you so much, Neil. God bless you. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. And there you have it, another amazing, like triple amazing guest that I had here on today's show on Raising Private Money. And I appreciate you joining us. We always appreciate you uh, sharing, liking, subscribing, reviewing. If you happen to be watching on YouTube, be sure and subscribe and click that bell so you don't miss out on any more amazing episodes coming up. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.